So it's 11 days till the European elections. Who are you going to be voting for? I'm going to vote Labour, and I make the case in the article this morning as to why you, you can, because in the end, there are some great Labour candidates who are very staunchly pro-Remain. I think the basic soul of the party is, is with Remain. But what I'm saying is the important thing is to vote. So I do come across a lot of Labour people that simply can't vote for Labour at the moment, in which case I say to them, don't stay at home, go and vote for one of the avowedly Remain parties. Because what will matter is at the end of this election, there's going to be a totting up, there's going to be a ledger, and on one side of the ledger go, will go Mr Farage and his fellow travellers like Boris Johnson and the Conservative Party, and on the other side are going to be those that are anti that position, anti Farage, anti Brexit, and it's important that it's not so much the seats, but the percentage of the votes. It's important because MPs will then make their decision as to what they do in Parliament. It's important that that anti-Brexit side of the ledger is stronger than the pro-Farage side of the I'm ledger. I'm just trying to work out how you can put Labour on the anti-Brexit side of the ledger. Yeah. And they have said that they only support a second referendum to stop a Tory Brexit when Jeremy Corbyn is in talks with Theresa May trying to get a deal through. Surely, when people tot up the ledger, they'll put the Brexit party on one side and then they'll put the Lib Dems, Change UK, the Green Party, the SNP on the other. Yeah, well, I mean, that's a perfectly valid point. I think, though, it, it, it misses this point, which is one of the reasons why, if you listen to what Nigel Farage says, he's very much saying that Labour is essentially a Remain party. I think... It's clear they're not remain in an unequivocal sense, but I think there's enough in the Labour case that allows you still to vote Labour, and that's why I can vote Labour in, in this election. But, you know, the reason I'm saying what I'm saying today is that I understand there are a lot of people who just say, and I've found this talking to people, they just say, I'm sorry, Labour's been uh, hopeless on the question of Brexit, I'm not prepared to do that. And what I say to them is, well, don't stay at home, because if you do, then that pro-Farage, hard or no deal Brexit, and that's what these guys are, Ian, the people in the Conservative Party like Boris Johnson are going for. That is a hard Brexit or a no deal Brexit. That is an extreme position that will do enormous damage to our country. If you care about stopping that, get on the other side of the ledger, and I think Labour just gets there. I mean, it, this is almost as close as you could get as a former Labour Prime Minister to telling people to vote for other parties other than Labour, isn't it? Well, look, it's, it's a one issue politics at the moment, effectively. And what we've got to understand is, if these people have their way, the hard or, or Brexit or no deal Brexit people have their way, we're going to be doing nothing but Brexit for the years to come. I mean, what we've got to realise is that Nigel Farage and the people associated with them. They're not the people to drain the swamp of British politics. They're the people that have created the swamp. They've literally created this issue of Brexit as if it's the answer to the country's problems, when it's literally the answer to nothing. And we will be, we've been obsessed with Brexit for three years. We're going to be obsessed with Brexit for years to come, unless we come out and show equivocally that they do not speak for Britain. That there are lots of people there who want us to get this Brexit thing resolved in a sensible way that allows us to stay within the European Union and get on with dealing with the real issues of the country, the health service, climate change, the economy, um, knife crime, all the issues that are presently absolutely relegated to the back burner because of Brexit. I mean, some supporters of Nigel Farage would say that actually the politicians who have created the swamp are the establishment politicians of the last few decades, yeah. such as yourself, who have ignored people's concerns on immigration, who have ignored people's concerns on globalisation, and that's why we're in this situation now. Absolutely. This is exactly what they say, and that's why they've got to be taken head on. Because when you actually analyse what they're saying, what, it, what does Brexit do for the National Health Service? The National Health Service futures decided... In Britain, it's not decided in Brussels. What does it say about our taxes? We can put our taxes up, down, do whatever we want with public spending. We put it up, put it down. That is decided here in the UK. It's not decided in the European Parliament. If you take the issues, for example, any of the things that really concern people, the communities left behind, inequality, the decisions that will affect that are taken here. The whole of the Brexit case is based on a myth that we're not in control of our own country. And... What Nigel Farage and his people want to do is to use this Brexit issue because they have a, their own agenda around the country. They want to use it to split the country over Brexit when it's literally the answer to nothing. So, you know, yes, I agree, of course, that what they want to do is to say, look, there's just an elite of people who are stopping you getting your way. But get our way to what? I mean, 
What is it that they believe that Brexit will offer us that allow us to take this country forward? And if they get their way, because, you know, they're in a no deal position. Let's be clear. What, what do they say about no deal? No deal, no problem. This is Nigel Farage and Boris Johnson. So just analyze that for a moment. We are going to change overnight with no deal the trading terms for hundreds of billions of pounds worth of trade in the UK. And there's going to be no problem, not some problem, but we can overcome it. No problem. That is such an extreme position that it's necessary now for people who are against that to rally together. So, yes, I agree. It's a very odd situation to be in when you, you're fighting a European election campaign without really an effective leader and without one party to vote for. I agree it's a very odd situation, but it still matters. I mean, you've described the Labour Party position on Brexit as destructive indecision. I mean, what do you mean by that? What I mean by that is, look, why are the two main parties imploding over Brexit? And they're in a situation where both of them are losing support because there has been one fundamental strategic fallacy at the heart of both main parties position on Brexit. And that is to believe that there's a compromised form of Brexit that will satisfy and bring together both sides of the country. And I'm afraid it's a fallacy because the soft Brexit that Theresa May has tried to articulate and that, in a sense, the Labour Party's official position has been up to now, it won't work. And it won't work for a very simple reason. Because, actually, the whole case of the Brexiteers is based on a myth, which is that we don't control our own laws, they have to target the laws of the single market, because it's true we've agreed collectively to agree those with the rest of Europe. And therefore, what happens is, if you end up with a Brexit compromise that is a soft Brexit, which is very well intentioned in its thinking, but you end up in a situation where effectively you stay in the trading system of the European Union, abide by its rules, but have lost your seat at the table. That soft Brexit is never going to command anything other than a tiny support, because the people who want Brexit are going to say it's a betrayal, and the people like myself who want to stay will say it's completely pointless. Well, let's have a look at um, what people do want. We can have a look at the latest poll, shall we, um, about the European uh, elections. And you can see here, I mean, the Brexit party is absolutely topping the poll there. They've got more support than the Lib Dems, the Green Party and Change UK combined. I mean, do you look at this and think... Actually, you've got it wrong. Most people don't want a second referendum. You know, if you look at the 34%, that is, and it you know could get higher than that, but I don't believe a majority of people think Nigel Farage speaks for the country. I really don't think that. But the question is, do the majority of people want a second referendum? If you look at these polls, you have to say they don't. Well, you, what you have to say is, it's the country is deeply divided. So here's, here's because sometimes when I say, look, another referendum could be a healing process. People say, well, how can that possibly be? What we have to understand is the only Brexit that makes sense in the end is a Brexit that appeals to Brexiteers. I mean, let's agree there's absolutely no point in doing a Brexit that the people who've advocated Brexit say is a betrayal. But some people would say a Brexit at least is respecting the democracy of the referendum and also potentially the European elections as well, the two clear votes we've had on Europe. No, because what you've just pointed out is the party that's way ahead on Brexit is the Farage party. That's a hard or no deal Brexit. So what, there's no point in thinking that you're you're going to have people saying, well, you've respected the 2016 referendum if you do a Brexit, that the very people who advocate Brexit say isn't properly Brexit. This is why I say to you, in the end, a soft Brexit for reasons... You know, I completely understand why people are putting it forward. It looks like a smart sort of compromise. But in the end, it falls apart because it pleases no one. That's why both main parties are in the difficulty they're in. In my view, if Labour had taken a strong position right from the very beginning, which is to say, OK, we accept the referendum result, but we reserve the right once we see the outcome of the negotiations, we reserve the right to put it back to the people. It would be in a hugely much stronger position today because it would be hoovering up all those votes that are presently for the Liberal Democrats, the Green, uh, the Change UK, and you haven't added in the SNP, but I think that's about 4%, which actually adds up to pretty much almost 30%. So the point is very, very simple. In the end, what should happen, and this is what Theresa May should have been doing months ago, but she could still do it even now. The government has got to grip this process in Parliament. It's got to set out the true options, which are hard, soft, 
or no deal Brexit. It's got to set them out. It's got to make Parliament come to a decision. And then Parliament will have to decide, once it decides on what form of Brexit, does it attach a confirmatory referendum to it? And I think the moment you force people to decide whether you want hard, soft or no deal Brexit, they will realise in Parliament the sensible thing is to share responsibility for that huge decision with the British people. And in the course of that, by the way, then I think you can get a healing process because in the end you can properly explore the arguments in a much more informed way than we were able to do back in June 2016. Okay, I just want to have a look at um, something you said recently about the possibility of a second independence referendum in Scotland. You said this, I don't think we should have one unless there is a really is a big groundswell of opinion for it, and I don't see that. The last thing we need at this moment is another huge dose of constitutional uncertainty. How can you think that about a Scottish referendum uh, and yet be in favour of a second referendum when there doesn't seem to be that decisive groundswell of support for it? Well, I don't know that there isn't a, there is a huge amount of support for a second referendum. Whether it's a majority or not, it's absolutely clear that, that there is strong support for it. it's important if there's a majority, isn't it? Well, how can you tell whether... You, you can't tell ultimately whether there's a majority unless you put it to the people. But I think the two things are completely different. We're about... Just imagine this scenario. Supposing we know, now go down the route... And let's be clear, I mean, I'm afraid Theresa May is not going to be the Conservative Party leader for much longer. If there's a Conservative Party leader ele leadership election now, you're going to get a competition in front of a small number of people as to which candidate could be more pro-Brexit than the other candidates. How long do you give Theresa May then? I don't know. I think if she set out the right set of options in the way I've described, I think she could stay to the end of the process. I think if she refuses to do that, look, you know, I'm not in charge of the Tory party, it's going to be very difficult for her. But the point is this, that in the end, when you look at the situation, you're going to have this fundamental division in the country. It's not the same as the Scottish independence referendum, because Right now, we're deciding whether to do Brexit or not. And the truth is, if we end up doing a hard or no deal Brexit, and I don't believe you can really justify that by reference to the June 2016 referendum, particularly a no deal Brexit, believe me, you're going to get a revolution in British politics the other way. I mean, people talk about you know, how you, you have to avoid those who, who feel strongly pro-Brexit, you have to avoid them rioting on the streets and, and you know, this out bursts of populism. Okay, I understand that. And that's why you've got to handle this issue. I agree very, very carefully. But let me just tell you this. If we go ahead and tumble out of the European Union with a no deal Brexit of the sort that Farage and Boris Johnson, these people want, you are going to get a silent revolution in this country as well. There are going to be people who are going to feel so strongly about this that I just say this to both main political parties, they're going to sweep them away. It's interesting listening to you talk about this silent revolution, about the kind of the groundswell of huge feeling on both sides of the argument. And it feels that to me as well, actually, you know, when you go around and talk to people from different parts right. of the country, it's, it's the trust in politics and the frustration that is so intense. I mean, are you actually concerned about when the dust will settled on what we do with Brexit? What are the long term consequences going to be of this trust in politics and also potentially in democracy as well? No, I think that it, it, look, we have divided our country in a very deep way. And I don't think you can reconcile the country over Brexit per se. I think what you could do is get to a situation where if, as I hope, we, we still escape Brexit, you then have to deal with those issues around immigration, um, around communities and people who feel they're casualties of globalisation or beneficiaries of it. You have to deal with those issues. That's why... I'm not in a position of saying, look, you know, the, the concerns that underlay Brexit are irrelevant concerns or they don't matter. I'm, I'm still absolutely in the position of saying, no. If so you... Did you make some mistakes then? Because you're talking there about you know, people who are the casualties of globalisation. I mean, you really, when you were Prime Minister, you were the great advocate of globalisation, weren't you? Multiculturalism. Yeah, and I still am a big advocate of, of globalisation. But you have to make sure that those people who, who do not feel that they've got the same opportunities as those happy with this process of globalisation are looked after. And did One you do things, that enough? We put the biggest and largest investment into public services this country had seen since the Second World War. We introduced for the first time a minimum wage in the country. We made massive investments in the inner city. But when, did, you, when, you, when you search your soul, and by the way, did we, you do enough to try and 
address people's concerns on these issues? Well, you know, the easy thing for me to say is the way, no, I, we should have done more and so on. But frankly, when I left office in 2007, you know, this country, in terms of its public realm, and in terms of the investment and change we were putting into communities, it was huge. Now, had I still been in office, I mean, people often say about immigration, yes, but you let the, the, the European migrants come in in 2004 when these countries from the East joined the European Union. Okay, we can have a debate about that. But when people say, for example, we didn't, we weren't concerned with immigration. It's just rewriting history. We had legislation on reducing the numbers of asylum seekers. I actually left office with a whole process in place around identity cards necessary to keep a strong so check on who it, could come into the country, who couldn't come into the country. So why is which it we then that Nigel Farage is the politician who's managed to tap into people's concerns on globalisation, or on the mistrust in the establishment? Why is it him who's managed to address those concerns and not politicians from the centre ground such as yourself? Well, I, that's a really good question. And the answer is because we stopped addressing those questions. And all the way through, if you want to win, if you want to win from the centre ground, you've got to address the underlying anxieties that people have. And that's why I say to you, if, if we end up, because Brexit is the answer to none of the problems in constituencies like mine in the north of England, if you end up changing Brexit, you've got to combine that with measures that deal with their underlying concerns. And by the way, there's a much better chance of dealing with those concerns in Europe as a whole today, because if you take something like freedom of movement to people, there's a huge concern across the whole of Europe today. It's not just a British problem. On immigration, it's clear that it's, a, it's upending European politics. No, the reason why we're in this position is that the centre ground stopped dealing with the concerns that people have. And if you don't deal with those concerns, they then are prey to the type of populist rhetoric that people like Nigel Farage and Boris Johnson pursue, when actually the politics that, that people like Nigel Farage represent offer nothing to these people. I mean, if, you, if you're in the north of England, you're worried about your community being left behind, what's Brexit going to do for you? It's just going to make your problems worse. You see, it sounds like a very you know, convincing argument for the centre ground and the strength of the centre ground. But I just wonder if your analysis is 10 years out of date. I mean, has politics changed? It's identity politics now, isn't it? Yeah, but the, the thing about politics is it doesn't stay in one place. And you've got to give people leadership. Look, identity politics, of course your sense of identity matters. But the fact is, what is driving globalisation, just to, to turn to that for a moment, what's driving globalisation is the real world. It's not governments that are driving it. It's technology, it's um, travel, it's um, mass migration, which is happening all over the world. So the question is not how you stop globalisation, because it's not possible to stop it. It's how you make sense of it and make it work for people. And let's be clear, if, for example, the world embarks on a new system of protectionism, it becomes anti-free trade, you know, supposing we withdraw from the, the single market, that's not going to help. If, that, if you look at the world, that is, that is what, it's, putting aside whether it's right or wrong, that is happening. You know, exactly. You're getting nationalist, uh, populist, strongmen leaders across the world. I mean, do you think Donald Trump understands the 21st century better than you do? No, I think he, what he understands is there's a big opportunity in exploiting that division. And what I understand is unless you deal with the underlying causes of division, you won't defeat that populism, but you can defeat it. And by the way, you're right. I mean, the Democrats in the US face exactly the same choices as the Labour Party here. If you go off to the, 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 the left, and you stop talking to people in the centre, then those people in the centre can then gravitate towards the right. Because as I always say to people, if you end up with a populist left fighting a populist right, the populist right will win. I mean, Change UK have tried to um, build a politics from the centre and they've had some teething problems, to, to say the least. You know, the polling's poor, they have not even standing a candidate in Peterborough. Are you talking to Change UK? I've talked to the, the people who, who are in Change UK a, a lot, yeah, and, and a lot of the, what they say I, I sympathise with. But, you know, leave aside whether they've got support or they don't have support. You've also got to look at the position of the Labour Party today. I mean, we've just had local elections. Local elections, any opposition party can win local elections. I mean, in the 30, 40 years I've been in politics, no matter how difficult the position of an opposition party is. When you go into local elections, you can be pretty sure of winning those. We didn't even win them. So Labour's also got a lot of thinking to do about where it places itself, whether it's got an agenda that actually meets the challenges of Does the it? future. No, I think at the moment it, it doesn't. I mean, the single biggest challenge 
that we are going to face as a country, the world is facing at the moment, is the technological revolution. It's literally the 21st century equivalent of the 19th century industrial revolution. How we deal with that, how we access its opportunities, mitigate its, its problems and its displacement of jobs and so on, that is the central question of politics. We're not even talking about that in the UK today. And, you know, this is what is so frustrating and depressing about Brexit. It's not just the destructive impact, it's the distractive impact. It's the fact that when these huge challenges are coming down the line, you've got the entire political energy of the country sucked into Brexit. Okay, Tony Blair, we're out of time. Thank you very much for being on the programme today.